So we're here in front of the Knight's Tomb, and we're working on the final phase of the conservation. It's been reconstructed and is now structurally sound. All the fragments have been joined back together again and made it one. And the next step of the process is to infill the loss along all the breakage lines. And that is what is uh, being conducted today. And as well as in the background, we're clearing off uh, a varnish or some type of a surface treatment that had been applied to it historically in some uh, unknown kind of restoration effort. So in order to make this infill material, we're going to combine primarily two components, which are going to be very finely crushed slate. That's a dark color slate, almost a black, combined with a natural hydraulic lime, which is the binder. The color will be a little too light once those two uh, materials are mixed, so we're going to tweak it and enhance the coloration with uh, iron oxide-based black pigment. So we're going to overview the process of creating this composite patching infill material, and we're briefly just going to show the steps involved and then mix up a little bit of the material and then show the application process. And so um, what we're starting with here is actually a piece of um, very dark slate, the blackest slate I could uh, find. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pulverize it. So the idea is to make it as fine as possible. And then we can run it through a number of different screens to filter out the larger aggregate that doesn't get crushed as thoroughly. Now there's no one exact size of the particle size that's needed. It depends on the thickness of the crack that we're infilling. As a general rule, you want the aggregate to be no bigger than about 50% of the size of the void because you don't want it to span the whole crack or that'll inhibit binder from being on the edges and the mortar from curing properly. So now I just made a little bit. There's a much larger pile that I created yesterday afternoon. And what we can do now is take this and we can run it through a screen and then it'll pick up the biggest size. This is a very coarse screen and obviously will go finer and finer. So we can go ahead and mix some now from what was uh, made yesterday. So it's going to have three different components. It's going to have uh, the natural hydraulic lime, which is right here. And I'm going to just make a small amount. And I'm going to use actually measuring spoons for this. And so this is a tablespoon. And we're going to do this in a one part binder to two part aggregate ratio. So the next, we're going to use two spoons of this. If I have enough here, I think I just do. OK, that's about one pretty soon. Okay, that's looking pretty good. So that's the second one. Okay, so that's our one to two ratio. So now we can go ahead and, and combine these two components in a dry form first. I know I'm going to need some aggregate in this based on the color. The, the NHL is going to lighten it up a bit. And um, you can see it's... You can take some of this original color and actually match this over here, and it's actually a pretty good match. If you see, there is a big variation in the um, color of the stone itself, which is typical on a historic stone. And if we put it over here, actually, it's almost a perfect match. You can hardly see the difference. So we're going to go ahead now. We have this um, NHL mixed with the aggregate, and we're going to take a little bit very small amount of this black, um, dark black iron oxide based pigment. And you're not going to see a big color change right now. And this, this part is difficult because without a very sensitive scale, uh, we're going to do this by eye. So we're going to go ahead and put water in now. Now generally as a rule, the water component is going to be about uh, one to four or five of the dry. In other words, about four parts of the dry equal one part of water. So you don't need a lot of water. Generally, the water is done by feel, not by measuring. Now, if we make it too wet, 
we can easily dry that up with um, paper towel or, or clean linen rags or something. We'll put it on here to show what it looks like in the texture. It's kind of hard to see in a container. It's a little wet. And I'll show you how we can easily dry this material out. So we can take a one of these absorbent blue towels. And I'll show you a trick I do a lot of times is I'm actually going to wipe this onto here and actually ball this up like this. And it will just draw the moisture right out. You can see the way the towel gets wet. And I can come back onto here now. And now I have a really nice infill material. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to go as deep as we can to fill all the voids and we don't want to do it too quickly. We want to get good compaction and good, uh, get it to adhere well. And so we can start to kind of push this material in. And the first application is going to be what's called a scratch coat, meaning that it's going to be thin. Uh, some people call it a peanut butter coat. It's going to be a little wetter and it's kind of similar to in woodwork sizing the wood. So we want to get good adhesion for the buildup off of the initial scratch coat. So that's really important because if you just jam a lot of material in quickly, you're not going to get good uh, connecting between the materials and it's, it's likely it'll, it'll fail and crack later. Okay, so we're going to start to come up. Now it's also not important that there's a perfect color match with this because I'm not even going to go up to the surface with this. This is going to be the build up. Now, generally you want to push down a little to the side. Most people when they first to do anything with kind of repair and, and pointing tend to over tool the, the joints and that will uh, bring moisture up to the surface and make it overly wet but you want to push down so you get good compaction and get rid of all the voids. Now it's best to leave about a quarter inch to three eighths inch for the final coat and so I'll kind of be doing the base coat here. Now the curing will be affected by the temperature. It happens to be a very hot day here although probably the biggest factor would be being in the direct sun or wind and so actually the curing is very the curing conditions are really good for, for mortar because we're not in the sun. So the sun will tend to cause it to want to flash cure, which means that it'll dehydrate before it, before it actually chemically converts it to a mortar. Now one of the things about using this material that's derived from the natural hydraulic limes is going to be much more friendly to work with, meaning that it's going to cure more slowly so we have a longer working time but then also the cleanup around this area is going to be uh, much easier and it's going to have a much longer window and it's, it's never going to get as hard as a Portland cement. It's a much more pure material. There's no uh, contaminants in it. Portland cement today is derived from a lot of uh, byproducts from manufacturing and it's uh, full of all different chemicals that are not good to breathe or for stone. So it's kind of the basic process. Now this is an area we did late yesterday as a kind of test of the material and the color and I kept it moist all night by covering it with moist paper towel and then plastic and so right now the color is a little darker than the stone but it's actually changing as the day wears on and um, you can see everywhere the water gets, the stone gets much darker, so that um, is always a factor. We can also dry this up pretty quickly and then it will evaporate to show that the infill in here is a pretty good match. And again, that was only a first test to match the color and test the material out. So I'm going to continue performing the infill process the next couple days and then all these cracks and voids will be filled in and uh, the tomb, the knight's tomb will be stabilized and then the work is still continuing with staff here that are removing 
little bits of uh, varnish or some type of a surface treatment that was historically applied to bring back the original color of the stone. It's going to, the tomb itself is going to be temporarily moved out of the church due to ongoing archaeology work here and for safekeeping. And it will probably be on display uh, at another location in the facility here. And then everyone is looking forward to the reinstallation of the Knight's Tomb sometime probably late in 2018 or before 2019 uh, comes around. So uh, stay tuned and we'll continue with this process.